Look at how everybody got so quiet as if we were like in a library or something. Uh, how many times have you used that? <laughs> I, forgot, I forgot who was over here. <laughs> um, are we ready? Yes, we're ready. I, I need another 10. <laughs> Uh, good evening, everyone, um, and welcome to Westport Library and Westport Stories Live. I'm Joan Hume, Community Relations Director here, and I'm glad to see so many of you here tonight. Uh, Westport Stories is a community project to record and archive stories of individuals who make up Westport's history. Westport has people with amazing stories. Some of these stories are global while others are as simple as how two people met. Or children interviewing their parents or friends interviewing friends and neighbors interviewing somebody else. And they all make up the history of Westport. So along with the live audience, all of you that are here in the room tonight, we are welcoming the audience who's watching it live on Ustream TV. And for those of you who are on Ustream watching this, in order for you to ask a question or make a comment, you need to create a free account. And if you're on Ustream, you know what that means. We are also streaming live on the town of Westport uh, site tonight, so be, remember to behave. You know. And if you are on Twitter, we invite you to comment or ask a question using hashtag WStories. So, for all of you that are here tonight, we are honored to have David Pogue as our guest. He will be interviewed by West Porter Mark Mathias, who has worked in the field of technology for both large and small companies, and he is the technology columnist for Westport News. David Pogue is a Westport resident, and he writes the tech column for the New York Times every week and Scientific American every month. And on TV, you may know him from his funny tuck videos, some of them filmed right here in the library on CNBC every Thursday, or his stories for CBS Sunday Morning, or the Nova miniseries he hosted on PBS called Making Stuff. So with more than three million books in print, David is one of the world's best-selling how-to authors. He wrote or co-wrote seven books for the Dummy series, and he launched his own series of complete funny computer books called the Missing Manual series. He graduated from Yale with a distinction in music and spent 10 years conducting and arranging Broadway musicals in New York. He's won an Emmy, a Loeb Award for Journalism, and an honorary doctorate in music, and he's been profiled on 48 Hours and 60 Minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, both here and at home, we present Westport Stories. Thank you. And I'm afraid that's all the time we have. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> actually, I have to apologize to the uh, town of Westport. The, the last time we did this, uh, we were not actually video streaming. We were just doing a cable, closed circuit uh, television through the town. But now, because we're live streaming, I'm sure anyone who's doing email or watching uh, Netflix over the internet, I'm sure all of the town is going to be slow because of the internet. People are tuning into this, uh, <laughs> this podcast. And I'm sure the, the, the entire global internet has, is slowing <laughs> down rapidly. It's bringing the thing to its knees. <laughs> yes. Very happy to have uh, David Pogue here with us tonight. Uh, you obviously we had a, a brief introduction here. Uh, one of the things that we're doing with Westport Stories, though, of course, most people know about uh, David as uh, as a technologist, and we're not really going to talk about technology tonight. Uh, as uh, Joan indicated, there are a lot of the stories here of people in town that have kind of the story behind the the, the person, and Westport Stories is really to record some of those. And that's what this is all about. So we're going to talk about just kind of the life, what Westport is like, uh, people's connections with Westport, uh, and uh, just find out a little bit more about that. I mean, we might get a little tech in. I find it hard to believe. And I also see a piano uh, lurking <laughs> suspiciously over there. Uh, just I understand that was just, just in case something might happen. Uh, but just with that, I want to introduce the, the Westport Stories Live, uh, which is the, the live part of Westport Stories. And there's another part, too, that we're working on, which are one-on-one -on -one interviews with people uh, that we're going to be working with the library to produce and uh, archive on YouTube. They're one-on-one -on -one video interviews with people that talk about, as Joan was saying, when kids ask their parents, how did you meet mom? Or what was it like when you went to school here in Westport in the, in the 50s? And there are just a lot of stories that people have about life in Westport that we want to record, we want to archive. 
And uh, this is one of those that's in a public place, but we're working with the library to have the community, not just us, but people doing these sorts of interviews with other people in their home, at the park, at schools, wherever it might be. So we'll talk more about that, or if somebody has some questions, they can ask me or ask the, the library staff about that. But this really is a community experiment to see how we can do that. So with that, let me go ahead and start with the first question. Well, actually, I, do people know who you are? Uh, um, some do. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're like Mr. Westport, right? So you're on the Board of Education. This, this whole thing is your puppy, isn't it? This, this project is your idea. It, it's, it actually came from, yes, is the short answer. Um, okay, but, let's get to the first question. <laughs> <laughs> um, but just a little background. Some of you may be familiar with the, uh, the program called StoryCorps, that's C-O-R-P-S that does audio recordings of, of people. And the, the thing that bothered me about that is there was no video. I mean, you, you hear the people, but you can't see them. And to me, part of the, the intimacy of those, of those stories is hearing somebody tell their own story and actually seeing them. And so the idea came to me that, you know, why don't we do that here in Westport, but let's add video to it. And because, you know, as you can see, we have two cameras here, one streaming, one, I guess, just videotaping. We've got some cameras mounted here that are going through town hall and over the channels. You can now do this. It's now affordable. It's now the technology is available to do that. Yeah, so, you guys thought you had no privacy before. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, when, I, when I brought this idea to the library, they were very receptive of it. And they said, yeah, let's, let's get a good whirl. So here it is. That's why it truly is an experiment. But uh, I, so I appreciate you uh, uh, letting people know, and we, we do want your involvement and participation. So whatever you can do to help us would be great. Now, back to you. Actually, I have a few more things first. <laughs> uh, David, how did you come to Westport? What was, you know, there are a lot of places one can live, and you're here. Right. Well, I, um, so I went to school in New Haven and then went to New York to do the Broadway thing. So I was living on the Upper West Side for 10 years, and then... Um, uh, my ex-wife Jennifer was just finishing her medical training and wanted to set up a practice somewhere where we would be for good. And I was doing a lot of teaching, uh, giving private lessons on computers to celebrities in New York in those days. So I wanted someplace close enough to New York that I didn't have to give up that side of my career, which is hilarious because I gave it up anyway within <laughs> like a year. Um, and, um, and she wanted, so we, we studied carefully, we looked at all the different towns and we picked Stanford. Um, <laughs> so we lived in Stanford for nine years um, until the, the tech bubble burst in 2001, and everybody was out of work, and Stanford had no tax base. You know, it's kind of a, a blue collar town, Stanford. It's a working town, and, and with everybody laid off, there was no taxes coming in. So they started cutting, uh, uh, th then, then Mayor Dan Malloy um, started cutting uh, uh, programs. Um, and he cut the gifted program in the schools that our kids were in. He cut the music program, K through 12. Um, he cut sports until 10th grade, um, just right and left. There were, there were 106 layoffs in the school system, teachers and administrators. The class sizes, I remember, were actually going to be larger than the state allows. But, you know, what could we do? We didn't have the money. Um, and I just remember, the, the, and, and so we did, we did petitions and fundraisers and bake sales and board of ed meetings and I made impassioned speeches and uh, everybody did. Um, I remember that there was this one board of education meeting where the number of speakers lined up to speak in, in protest about cutting the schools. I mean, literally, I think they were there until three in the morning. There were so many people who wanted to speak and the law says everyone gets two minutes. So. Um, anyway, it was, it was just a bloodbath and a disaster, and so it was like rats leaving a sinking ship. Everyone was either moving or putting their kids in private school, um, or both. And so uh, we decided to move, and obviously we came because of the schools. Um, Westport has always seemed to me like kind of the, the farthest suburb where you can conceivably still be part of the New York thing um, before it gets ridiculous, you know. I think probably once you're into Fairfield, you know, then, then the commute gets to be really extreme. So, um, and it seemed to me, my, my impression was there seems to be some kind of law, you can't live in Westport unless you have children. I mean, like, <laughs> everywhere, like the place exists for children. So that, that appealed to us a lot. I think there's something in the water, you know, that, that does that. <laughs> That's right. Um, and, and your first memories of Westport, because in terms of coming here, I'm sure you were, you were house hunting, 
What was it about Westport that said, this is, I mean, you mentioned the schools, but there are a lot of things that Westport has. What, what are your first memories of Westport, either as, as you were looking here or once you decided you're here and you're established yourself? So um, actually, my fir our first memories of Westport were long before we lived in Westport. We used to come up here from Stanford for some of the restaurants, some of the kids' activities, um, and for Campo Beach. Apparently, you're allowed to go for free in the winter. <laughs> The townies are all gone for the winter. So, um, but actually, um, my first experience with Westport, Connecticut happened even before that. This is an absolute true story that I don't think anybody knows. Um, in 1983, uh, I was an a undergraduate at Yale, and the music department forwarded the most unusual request. The town of Westport, Connecticut had agreed to produce a Wild West show in a high school auditorium called Stapley's. Stapley's Auditorium, said the paper, Staples. Um, and um, they were looking for a composer. So my, I fancy, I was a music major, I fancied myself a theater composer, and they were gonna pay $1,000 to whoever would write the score for the show, which to me was you know, $1,000 more than I'd ever been paid for composing music before. So I agreed and I met with this guy, Appaloosa Andy. Does anyone remember this? Nobody, <laughs> oh man, some of you were old enough to remember. So I thought, you know, um, so uh, it was called Appaloosa Andy's Wild West Show. And Appaloosa Andy was this long, gray, silvery gray haired, like ex hippie. And he went everywhere with this roadie, this guy who looked like meatloaf. In fact, he used to be a roadie, like <laughs> carrying amplifiers for rock groups, this big, you know, studded, tattooed, swarthy guy who was kind of Andy's handler. So Appaloosa Andy had this fantasy that he would produce a Wild West show for the benefit of this town. And it was supported by the Westport Police Athletic League. It was funded by the Police Athletic League. And apparently Andy told him, look, if you put up the dough, you can make all kinds of money. You'll be doing a great thing for the community. We'll put on a heck of a show. And guess what? I have the perfect host, Clayton Moore, the Lone Ranger from television. The guy is now like 140. <laughs> <laughs> but he's agreed to host the show. He was going to be the star of Westport's own Wild West show. So um, the whole thing was weird from day one. And he said, we've got animals. We're going to have camels and horses. I kid you not. And not only that, but we have hired to be the animal handler the very woman, Drusilla Davis, who does it for the Radio City Rockettes Music Christmas Spectacular. She's the one who handles the camels for that, and we got her. Um, camels in a Wild West show. Hey. Okay. Everybody's a you. judge. Um, <laughs> so it just got weirder and weirder. And um, so I met, so Appaloosa said, uh, if I may call him Appaloosa, um, Appaloosa said, we want to meet with you over the summer to discuss the score. Um, and I said, well, the problem is I'm conducting at a summer theater on Cape Cod, this, this college light opera company it's called, um, and I'm going to be there for nine weeks conducting musicals. And he goes, that's okay, we'll come up. I'm like, really? It's, it's kind of like a closed campus. I'm not sure you can like, just come in and eat with these conservatory music students. He's like, that's, that's all right, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll figure something out. So I'm eating lunch at the, <laughs> at the uh, rehearsal hall, and the director of the company comes up and goes, David? There's somebody here to see you. <laughs> I'm like, oh, really? He's out in the yard. So I go out in the yard. Appaloosa Andy and the roadie guy had set up a card table. And this being Cape Cod, because they weren't allowed in the cafeteria with the kids. So this being Cape Cod, they had gotten a couple of lobsters. So we're talking lobsters. We're not talking plates or silverware or napkins. We're talking lobsters on the coffee table. It was the weirdest. He's like, here, you know, like, what are we doing? We're having lobster. We're talking about the score. Oh my God, it was so surreal. But, but he gave me a $500 check on the spot, which was a good start. And then, um, then the, the music on the radio, um, I'll never forget, it was like the disco era. And there was some, uh, I mean, I, oh, I remember it was jump for my love, do, 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 do. And he plays this for me on a tape deck and he goes, I want the score to sound like that. I'm like, really? A disco Wild West show? This just gets better and better. 
So I wrote about five songs for the show, which was like a quasi-musical, like a little boy whose Wild West toys come to life in his dreams. And so he sings, and, and well, Clayton Moore did not sing. Uh, you'll be grateful. Um, so the bottom line is the show went on, and I came down from Yale to see it. Uh, I recorded the whole thing. I had a little pocket recorder. Um, it, it got off to a terrible start when Clayton Moore himself, he's, first of all, Clayton Moore was not allowed by Paramount, who owned the TV show, to wear the famous mask. So that was a copyright violation. That's a trademark. So what does he do? He goes everywhere on his public appearances wearing Ray-Bans, <laughs> wraparound sunglasses to simulate the lone, ra oh my god. So he hobbles out at the beginning of the show, and he goes, hello, New York. <laughs> Oh my God, he's gone, he's just gone, you know? And, um, and then the, the kid came out and he sang the first song and it went fine, the, the music was pre-recorded. And then, um, uh, and then they, had, they had a sharpshooter act, they had this professional sharpshooter. The set looked like the interior of a canvas tent, it was like half a canvas tent, and they had balloons, like toy party balloons, stapled up to it. So the sharpshooter comes out with this pistol. He goes, I'm the sharpshooter. And then he goes, he aims at a balloon and goes, pop! That was his act! Pop! I could do that. I mean, that's, he would like keep shooting at the balloon until it popped. It was ridiculous. And, it, and then they would try, they had these animals, and he, I, I still remember they had, one of them was a donkey, and it just would not come on. The guy was like, and the animal handler from Radio City was behind its the ass's ass, if you will. Um, it, was, it was just, it was hilarious. It was, it was uh, you know, top to bottom a disaster. Um, and I, my, on my recording, here comes the finale, this, this beautiful song I wrote about the Old West. And here comes the, the guitar, do, 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 and you hear <laughs> the guy right in front of me was like snoring into the mic, which I didn't discover until I got it home. And you know, oh God. So the best part is that, did the Police Athletic League make a profit from this show? It did not. In fact, none of us were ever paid the remainder of what we were owed. Really? Appaloosa Andy absconded. Really? With the, the entire thing was a scam, top to bottom. It was for Appaloosa Andy alone, and he disappeared that night. I mean, you couldn't reach him. There were, this was before email, this was before cell phones. He was gone. And everyone's like, where is he? I don't know. We'll look him up in the book. Well, what's his last name? <laughs> I just called him Appaloosa. <laughs> he was a crook, and he took the police athletic league. And then, so the hilarious thing is, so I graduate. I go to New York. I'm a musical director in the pit. And um, if you're in the performing arts business, you live and die by this newspaper called Backstage. Backstage is where every production lists the casting calls for the people they want to come and be in the shows. And the auditions are all notified there. I swear to God, like four years later, Tampa, Florida, <laughs> Appaloosa Andy's Wild West show, now auditioning! <laughs> Can you believe? It was like the music man, right? He goes from town to town, taking them for 50 grand at a pop and then moving on. Isn't that wow. so amazing? So yes, I knew all about Westport. <laughs> I was in Staples Auditorium long before I knew it was safe. And even after that, you decided to come back. <laughs> it took me a couple of years before I'm like, wait, Staples, Stapleys. Hmm. Maybe it was after those animals that the reason we had to rejuvenate the high school. <laughs> That's right. That's why they did the $40 million renovation. <laughs> Camel poop. Yeah. Uh, so so what's, what's you, that was a long way to get here. Um, <laughs> good, though. Good. But once you actually located here, once you landed here, what, what, was the, what, what surprised you other than the fact that we didn't have a Wild West show every year? What were some of the things <laughs> at Westport that you found that, that surprised you once you got here? Um, well, to this day, I think I still have a hard time characterizing, like, the people. So, you know, the realtor said, oh, it used to be an artsy town. It used to be writers and artists, so you'll fit right in, David. Like, I, who've never worked an office job in my life, you know, I, I'm, I'm a writer and a musician and, and all that. Um, and so I'm like, wow, that's exciting, only to find out that 
you know, the guy to my right is a you know hedge manager, and the guy to my left is a Wall Street banker. You know, so so I can't say there's a lot of artists and writers on Woody Lane, you know, other than <laughs> me and my kids. Um, but uh, but they're here, they're here, and so so really, there's this huge cross section around here, which which constantly surprised me. I mean, just whoever you're sitting next to in Starbucks, like, so what do you do? And then it, it's there's never a characteristic response. So I'd say that's what surprised me. Okay. It also doesn't, I, I could be wrong because I've never li lived in Greenwich, but it doesn't seem to be, I mean, it has all the affluence and stuff, but it doesn't seem to be quite as obnoxiously pretentious. I mean, <laughs> maybe. We're working on that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure they'll edit that out of the video for anyone who's watching in Greenwich. I remember we looked, we looked at a house in Greenwich, by the way, and um, the, the description in the pictures were unbelievable. It was, it was within our price range, but it was like, you know, Louis XIV's mansion. It was just like, what is, are we missing here? It was just marble and gilt and like columns and yard and pond. And it was like amazing. <laughs> like we show up and we realized right away why. It's under 95. <laughs> 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 All night long. No wonder it was in our budget. <laughs> oh my God. Well, you know, to, to your point about the, the, the community being an arts community versus hedge fund, Wall Street type people, I think one of the reasons why the Westport Stories is such an interesting thing is because there is such a diversity in terms of every time, certainly I meet people, everyone has a story. And they're sometimes so vastly different that you can meet five different people that come from five different backgrounds. And that's one of the reasons why kind of recording that is, is an important thing. So it's, it's nice to to get these different perspectives. Or in some cases, like mine, one person from five different backgrounds. Right. <laughs> uh, you'll get it, just think about it. Um, what are some of the things that you, your favorite things here in town? I mean, we have a lot of things to offer people in terms of you know, recreation, food, uh, activities. What have you found that is, are the things that you find the most memorable of, of Westport in terms of activities that you, that you do or, or, or properties of Westport that make it special or unique from the places that you've perhaps have otherwise been? Right. Well, I mean, I'm sure my answers are going to be the same as everybody else's, but especially those with kids. But, I mean, you know, Longshore and, and Campo and, um, you know, the main drag, you know, the Post Road has just about everything. And actually, I find one of the best resources to be Fairfield because um, they have things like movie theaters and, um, and restaurants. Although we're working on that too. <laughs> yeah, I keep, keep reading on Westport now, you know, another movie theater initiative struck down. I, what's, what is their problem? Do you know anyone in city government? Oh, wait. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so Fairfield, Fairfield's great. Actually, all of the neighboring towns have stuff to offer. I mean, we go to Bridgeport for the big shows and the circus and... Um, uh, my daughter's taking dance and theater classes in, in Bridgeport and in Fairfield, and, um, and then you know, Norwalk has all the big box stores. And so, um, yeah, I guess, I guess the things that make Westport the most unique physically are the, you know, the, the shore location of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it. You've been here how many years? About five years, is that right, in Westport? Oh, my dear friend. Uh, 2003. Oh, really? Okay. Almost, all right. Almost 10 years. So, so you've been... But, in that time, we had some rather memorable things happen here in, in, uh, in, in Connecticut and certainly in the world. Power outages and snowstorms and things like that. What are some of the more memorable ones that you've gone through or experienced or, or things like that? How have, you, how have you dealt with that in terms of your, your Westport connections? Um, yeah, the, I think the most memorable, I mean, I mean, blackouts are cool as long as they're short, right? <laughs> like, they're a nice break, you know, you teach the kids about board games and readings and this is how the old folks used to do it. Now let's get the damn lights on! Um, but there was one, was it March of, it was March, 2010, 2009? One of those, which was it? In 2010, you'd read on Westport now how many homes were remaining without power. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it gets, gets smaller and smaller and smaller until it was only us and one other guy. <laughs> like, I'm one of the two left. Would you please fix it? So no power. You know, it's not like I'm a technology writer or anything. What am I supposed to do? I can't. I have no computers. I have no internet. I have no television. I know. First world problems, right? Um, but it was, it was, I mean, I have to keep the job going. And it was March 
I mean, it would have been maybe a little more pleasant if it were June, but it was March, and it was cold. And so we, we didn't move out. We, we live there. We don't have a generator. So <laughs> this, is, this is the thing about Woody Lane. Every time there's a, a power outage, you hear all the, you know which houses have the hedge fund managers. <laughs> All the, the, the generators come on. Fine, rub it in, pal. I'm teaching my kids the value of candles. Um, or just get a big extension cord and run it across the yard. <laughs> <I know. laughs> um, so uh, anyway, so um, yeah, so we, we did that thing. We would take showers at the local tennis club. Uh, we had friends who did have power, and we'd go over there for like tea, and, and all our gadgets would be charging during the tea. Uh, maybe one more cup, one more cup, I have 80% to go, you know. Um, and so we made it work. You know, we, 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 would, we would load up on battery juice for phones and laptops, and then, you know, go home for a couple days till that was dead, and then we'd, we'd do it again. So, um, and I did get a, a nice blog post out of that, you know, musings on the modern era where everything has to be power and how easy, easily this country would fall to, to terrorists who just <laughs> went to the power plant and went, ah, we win. <laughs> um, it, would be, it would be very easy. Um, the, uh, it's weird about that blog post, though, because, you know, when I, so I've been at the Times uh, 11 and a half years, and I was the first blogger. I was, I was doing a blog before everyone even knew what it was. And um, in the old days, it, it felt very communal. It felt very Westporty. This this blog and the comments, and and everybody knew who I was, and I would talk routinely about my family and my house and my kids and my my off time. Um, and then as as my profile rose and as the internet became the internet, um, things changed and things are are a lot more toxic online. You you must know this as a fellow member of the Technology Columnist Society. You must have noticed that people uh, are just, they're really caustic and nasty nowadays. It doesn't matter what you say. So if I tried to do that blog post today, well, even then, even in 2010, um, you know, shut up, you big whiner. There are people who don't have enough to eat. <laughs> like, well, I know. So I can't write about my six days in the Arctic? Um, so it's tough for me, you know. I, I'm, I don't like people, you know, dumping on me on, on the posts. But... Uh, even that, so now, nowadays I'd never get away with writing about that. Like, really? Yeah, you don't dare. You know, they just make fun of you. Now, now how did, how did your, your kids handle the, the, like the power outages? Was, was it fun for them? Were they, was it fun for the first day? And I see we have uh, at least one, two was in the Was it back fun? Here. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> the answer for those of you at home was no. <laughs> Wait, you stayed in a hotel? Why? Oh, <laughs> now I remember why I hated that period. So, um, wait, why did he stay in a hotel and we didn't get to? <laughs> but you thought it was epic, right, Jeff? Yeah. So that's my seven-year-old Jeff, and he says that it was a, it was fun because he got to stay in a hotel, which is the only place with electricity. Hope you loved it. <laughs> uh, you seem to be everywhere. I mean, it seems like every time we have some sort of an event that I, I hear you're, you're hearing about, it, how do you manage to, to do all that? I mean, you're... you're you think I'm everywhere? <laughs> Dude, there's seven of you. <laughs> Don't tell my wife. <laughs> um, you're a busy guy. How do you, yeah, how do you I am, keep it I all am straight? Really busy. And, and every now and then I... Um, I realize that I'm on the losing side of like staying together. Um, so I do um, I do the computer books that really pays the, the money. Um, the the missing manual series I do like five of those books a year, which which doesn't necessarily mean writing them. Usually it's updating them. Uh, so like every time there's a new version of Windows, I update Windows the missing manual. And every time there's a new version of the Mac operating system, I write Mac OS 10 the missing manual. <laughs> and then <laughs> two weeks ago, Apple announced. Guess what? They're going to start coming up with a new version of the Mac operating system every year. Well, that's good for business. No, <laughs> it's good for the suicide rate in my house. Um, no, it's uh, it's uh, it's going to be about to be really bloody. So, 
I do that, and I do. Um, I used to do a lot of speaking. The, the New York Times has sadly uh, cracked down intensely on speaking, and and now you're only allowed to speak for nonprofits. So so libraries, and and schools, and that's about it. So uh, yeah, so now now the books are my only income. Because <laughs> let me tell you something: you don't live in Westport, Connecticut, on a newspaper man's salary. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> um, and then, but I'm doing a lot of television. So. Um, this this mini series last spring called Making Stuff. Making Stuff, yeah. Yeah, it was it was an unbelievable experience. The 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 um, National Science Foundation gave PBS a three million dollar grant and said we'd like you to make a series of TV shows about material science. <laughs> and it's like oh my god, like studying materials. Like there's a real singing dancing TV topic. <laughs> so. They're like, this is unfilmable. Nobody, not even Nova, could make this interesting. And but so, you did. Well, not me. My, the, so, so for nine years, it sat there, this grant. And it expired at the end of nine years. So PBS is like, we're going to lose this money. We've got to do something. So they hired this, um, this production company in Boston they'd worked with before, whose, whose head is the, uh, what, do you, what do you call an idiot savant who's not an idiot? Uh, his, his, the head of it is this guy, a pr producer. Yeah, <laughs> a producer. Yeah. Uh, so um, anyway, and he had this concept that they would find a host. Nova does not have hosts. Nova is just a narrated show, a, a voice of God show. Um, but they wanted to find a host, and they intended to immerse him in all the things that they would be studying. So we studied shark skin. They made me put on a scuba suit and go to the Bahamas and handle nine-foot sharks. Um, they wanted to talk about bird feathers and the curvature of wings, so they had me hang glide. You know, they wanted to talk about new self-healing materials that the military is putting on their fuel tanks. So, so for years uh, in, in Iraq, we were sitting, oh, for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Um, so for years, the, the, the Iraqi bad guys would, would disable our, our tanks and our trucks just by shooting one bullet hole in a tanker truck, and that thing leaks 150 gallons an hour. So this truck is trying to take it to our guys out in some battle station. By the time it gets there, there's no fuel left for our troops. So this was a this simple, simple thing, one bullet in a fuel truck. Um, so these guys, came, these material scientists, came up with this amazing material, like a, like a spray-on latex filled with uh, uh, um, petroleum-loving sawdust, basically. So if you, sh you spray our existing tanks with this, you don't have to build new trucks, just spray the ones we've got with this material, and you shoot a bullet into it, it instantly closes. It seals itself and doesn't spill a drop. And so they had me, <laughs> stop smiling, uh, they had me take an AK-47 and shoot. We went way out into the Oregon woods, and they had me shoot an AK-47, and they showed um, how I couldn't hit the tank, but they got a sniper to do that part. Um, <laughs> And, um, and sure enough, you could not get this thing to spill a drop. It was totally amazing. Um, and, but anyway, but the point is, immerse the host in all these really terrifying, dangerous situations. So that was the, the gist of the show. And you know, I've never had so much fun in my whole life. And I, I guess you could tell this show that everyone thought was unfilmable. It was four one-hour episodes. It wound up getting the highest rating in seven years. For, for Nova, for Nova. So um, they're like, wow, well, this is great. Even though like, I'm not a scientist, and I've never studied science, I don't pretend to know about science. But you play one on television. But I play one on television. <laughs> they, they told me that they had tried hosts in the past who were scientists. And the problem with that is, like, let's say you're the scientist I'm interviewing. Um, you'll say something, and A, you might use jargon. And I, as a fellow scientist, know what it is. So I just go, oh, uh-huh, mm -hmm. while the whole viewing public is going, what about us? You know, and and two, he said that that sometimes they would get into a pissing match, the two of them. Well, that's not true. In a paper in 1963, he proved that. You know, so um, I think that's the thing. So that's led to all this really cool stuff. Uh, we've, the same group and I, the same production company, I've been shooting. An, uh, well, first of all, there's going to be a sequel. So there's going to be um, more, four more making stuffs. The the four original ep episodes were called Making Stuff Stronger, Cleaner, Smarter, and Cleaner, smarter, stronger, and something else. Um, what is cleaner? Safer. No, 
Fast, no, not faster. But anyway, but the next four are going to be more like that. But they're going to be even. Le they're not going to be related to material science anymore because that grant is done. But they're going to they're going to be still things like colder, which is like going to be maglev right. and superconducting mm -hmm. computers. Um, you know, cheaper, safer, and wilder, which is just going to be really really cool. Um, but it takes a year to get the money for a PBS show. So while we're trying to raise money for that, um, we're putting on a holdover show on April fourth. It's about to air. Uh, it's called uh, Hunting the Elements, and it's about the periodic table of the elements. It's fantastic, amazing stuff. It's a two-hour movie about the elements, and it's just as funny and just as crazy. You know, they had me do all this insane stuff again. And then... You're not going to give us any spoilers on this tonight, are you? Sure, sure. I can tell <laughs> I mean, I'm really super passionate about it. Here's a story that I bet you didn't know that affects every single one of you guys. So, um, rare earth elements. Mm -hmm. The, if you look at the period, so first of all, the periodic table. Do you know what's amazing about this table? It was created in like 1860 by this Russian chemist named Mendeleev. And he, this is before they even knew what atoms were. That there was no table, there's no atomic weight, there was no protons, neutrons. They didn't know about any of that. So, but he did notice that of the 63 elements known at the time, there were only 63, gold, silver, tin, copper, whatever, um, they had certain characteristics in common like um, um, calcium, sodium, those things explode when you put them in water. You can't miss it, okay? And then there are these gases on the other side of the table that don't react with anything, like neon that, that we put in, in lights. So all the ones down the left side of the table explode in water, all the ones down the right side of the table don't, don't react with anything else, and then all the ones in the middle, 80% of them are silver malleable metals. Did you know that? 80% of the elements are metal, silver metals. So, Crazy stuff. So he figured out a pattern of how these fit together. Now, much later, uh, with rows, you know, of, of similarly behaving elements. And the wild thing is, he found holes. There were elements that didn't exist that he said, well, according to my nice, neat, natural table, there should be an element right here next to copper, you know, but it, it didn't exist. And all the scientists said, well, then your table is wrong. And Mendeleev would say, oh, no, I'm not wrong. We just haven't found them yet. Can you imagine the gall? <laughs> and he was right. And by the time he died in 1907, we had found three of them that he theorized existed but had never been seen. Incredible, incredible. And since then, we found all the rest of them, including the rare earth elements. Now, the rare earth elements are not rare. There are more of them by weight in the Earth's crust than lead, for example. Um, and, but for years, we, they're called rare because they're very hard to extract from each other. For years, we didn't care about them. In fact, there was a mine in California that mined them. This is things like cerium and neodymium. And, um, and it shut down for environmental problems and because nobody cared about rare earth elements. Then the digital age came along. Ladies and gentlemen, every piece of electronics you own has rare earth elements in it. The colors on every flat panel TV come from rare earth elements, the reds, the blues, the greens, the yellows. Um, every iPod, the earbuds, have powerful neodymium magnets. That's the only reason you can get that sound from earbuds. Um, every hybrid and electric car has rare earth elements in the batteries. Otherwise, we couldn't make those batteries. Um, every smartphone has rare earth elements for every feature it's got. Everything, digital cameras, GPS, all of it, OK? So what's the problem? The problem is that 98% of the world's rare earth elements come from a single source, China. China. Mm -hmm. This was no problem as long as they were willing to sell it to us. For the last three years, they have been shutting down exporting of rare earth elements 30% a year. In the year 2012, China's rare earth elements will shut down to zero. So you guys think the petroleum, cri the oil shortage is a crisis? That was a warm-up act. So the public doesn't know about this. Congress does. We're, they're like, oh my god! Like, what are we going to do? The entire economy. Now, do you know why China has stopped exporting this stuff? Are they just mean? No, it's very simple. They say, no problem. Just build your stuff here. You can have all the elements you want. They want the jobs. China has huge unemployment. They want the jobs. So by forcing every single American manufacturer of everything to go to China to build the stuff, 
they corner the market. So are we completely screwed? No. Uh, remember that mine that shut down 15 years ago in California? They are gearing up. And by the end of this year, they hope to be back in production mining. And so for the show, we went there. I mean, I put on a pith helmet and went underground and watched the mining. And they, they're blowing up mountains, the whole thing. They, they expect in four years to be making 25% of the world's rare earths in this, in this mine. So there's incredible stories in, inside this periodic table that nobody really understands. Um, and, and then there's this guy named Theo Gray who, who writes a column for Popular Science Magazine where every month he shows you how to blow something up in your backyard. And we, we went to his... Uh, we went to his... Backyard? Backyard, <laughs> yeah. Bunch of blown up stuff. <laughs> yeah. No, he has a house and then way out in the country, literally in a cornfield, he has a compound, he calls it, um, where he blows stuff up. And he has all these illegal elements um, in, in forms you're not allowed to have and he has all these black market sources. And um, we did amazing experiments. Like, who knows the chemical formula for salt, table salt? NaCl, which means sodium chloride. It's made of two elements, sodium and chlorine. Who knows what chlorine was used for in World War I? It's a deadly poison! Who knows what sodium does when it gets wet? It explodes! We are taking two toxic, lethal elements and sprinkling them on our corn. <laughs> what are we doing? Well, we did it. We did it at Teo Gray's house, or compound. We went out, he, he had a fishing net and filled it full of popcorn, and then he took a, a metal mixing bowl and he put sodium in it. It looks like raw sodium, pure sodium, looks like Play-Doh, white Play-Doh. And then chlorine is a gas, so he had a canister of gas deadly poisonous gas, and he had fans all around so that if anything wafted our way, right, we would, we would be very ill. And he sprayed, uh, he, he put the, um, the chlorine gas, he flowed it onto this hunk of sodium, and all this sparks and thick white smoke came up and went into the popcorn. It was making salt. We made salt, organic, locally grown salt. Um, and then we ate the popcorn. <laughs> and, and, you, and we have no problems. <laughs> um, I mean, really, who here has ever made salt? None of you. It was, it was an amazing experience. And the reason why, by the way, is at the atomic level, um, every, the reason, um, so at opposite ends of the periodic table, all of the elements down here um, are desperate. They, they have these shells, right? Electrons spin in concentric shells. And all the ones over here have one short of a full shell. And I think we've all met people like that. <laughs> um, they're all desperate to have an even number, like eight, eight electrons. And the ones over here all have, uh, sorry, and, and the ones over here all have one extra electron. So when the two, so chlorine over here, sodium over here. So if they could get together, they could exchange that electron and both of them would be happy. There's a lot of like therapist talk in this show. Um, <laughs> and that's what happens when you put sodium and chlorine together. They, they reach peace, they're both fulfilled, and, um, and they make a tasty, uh, salty beverage. Um, <laughs> so anyway, so a lot of really cool stuff. And, and again, it's like going into this, and like you're gonna make a two hour movie about elements. Dudes, you know, are you thinking this through? But if you it do works. it entertainingly and funnily, it's, it's good, good TV. Now we're going to be. We've got a, a, a few more minutes. I want to actually take some uh, some uh, questions from the audience if they're coming in, Bill. I don't know if we have anything coming in yet, um, but, but I want to talk to you. You're, you're known for your technology. I want you to talk a little bit about your music because you're. From what I understand, I mean, your degree from Yale is in music. This is true. And yet you're known more for your technology stuff. Can you tell us about your your music interest and career and what what do you do in music other than we know you do a number of songs and things like that, but what, t talk about your, your music interests right now. Yeah, so I was a, a musical theater nerd from the time I was very, very young. So I was writing songs at six, seven, eight years old, and I was the piano player for the Cleveland Playhouse Youth Theater, and I'd write little musicals for them to put on, and I'd write musicals for my high school to put on, and, and then in college. So it's not, you know, it's not even, it's not, I'm not a, not a good classical pianist, I'm not a good rap artist, God knows. Um, but it's, it's musical theater. I don't know, something about me, you know, here I am, yes, a straight male. I don't know, I don't know why, <laughs> why it affects me that way. But, um, but I've always liked, um, 
something about the, the emotion of a, of a sung dramatic moment has always gotten to me. So I, I don't know why. I've always loved it. So, so yeah, so I wrote a musical a year while I was at Yale, and I would arrange them and conduct them, and then um, went to New York to, to try to, on the, uh, in the big, the big leagues. Um, and that was really the one big failure of my life. I, you know, I spent 10 years writing shows and putting on readings. You didn't learn the first time? <laughs> Cripes. Um, anyway, you know, there is a silencer switch on most phones these days. Just saying. Um, so, yeah, so I tried, to, I tried to make it on Broadway as a composer, and it took me 10 years to get that they, they weren't really producing new musicals by unknowns. You know, that, that era had passed. They were all revivals and, you know, Andrew Lloyd Webber and, you know, all th things like that. So I eventually sort of sidled out of music as a career, um, although, although for a while they were intersecting. Like, like my writing, my technology career began writing reviews of music software programs. So um, I sort of went sideways from one to the other. And, and I still, you know, I still play the piano all the time. And um, like, like, for example, um, we, t when we were trying to get the National Science Foundation to give us another million dollars to make the, the continuation of the series, mm -hmm. um, the PBS people thought it would be cute if I wrote a song. And I, we would go to Washington, D.C. It, it's the Corporation for Public Broadcasting that funds these things. So we would sit in this conference room where most people say, you know, uh, we request funding for our new show. Our research shows that the 17 to 34 demo uh, appreciates valuable programming. You know, so I would come in here and sing. So, <laughs> so I wrote this song called A Measly Million Dollars. And um, <laughs> they were all just like, <laughs> they had never seen a pitch like that. And we got the, we got the million dollars. So. Really? Yeah. I, I <laughs> Can we get you? Hang on, let's. Um, I wasn't really uh, intending to do this, so I might have to find the file. But um, <laughs> yeah, I know. That's a good idea. Instead of doing the same song parodies I usually do, I'll do one that no one outside of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting has ever heard uh, before. Um, can you? Um, Oh, here, CPB. Actually, while he's looking at it, uh, Bill, do we have any, uh, is anything coming over the, over the internet so we can queue that up? I don't know if that's happened. I did see one hand here, so we'll. One question was uh, from Bill, he asked if, uh, if Robert is deaf, is dying to know if David has plans for another children's book. He loves Abby Cornelia's one and only magical power. Oh, that is the, the question best is question just I've ever heard. You may not have heard is, uh, uh, David has actually written one children's novel already, and uh, Bill is asking if there's another novel <laughs> that can be expected at some point in time in the future. So yeah, so that was the most fun thing, the biggest you know dollars per hour waste of time I've ever done. But um, it's a really adorable book for middle schoolers, for like eight to thirteen. It's called Abby Cornelia's One and Only Magical Power. It was tremendous fun to do, and everyone who's read it, uh, I, I get I get all these emails from like these adorable eleven year olds. Um, and uh, I'm like, will you buy another copy? Um, <laughs> so uh, anyway, it was great fun to do. It didn't, you know, it sank like a stone. But, um, uh, but I would like to do another one. The publishers asked me to do another one. So um, it's a matter of, of finding the time. So um, the part I didn't get to is that Nova has now hosted, ha has now chosen me to be the host of my own series that debuts this fall called Nova Science Now. And so we're in the middle of shooting that. Those are hour-long episodes. And again, it's your tax dollars at work, so you may as well watch it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I'd very, very much like, talk about high tech. I love these. Those of you who are over 40 know that your eyes go. So look at this. <laughs> OK. The economy's in trouble, education lies in rubble, the Wall Street finance bubble has burst. There's a growling in the belly, half our brains have turned to jelly, and the programs on the telly, the worst. We can't watch America fall. Just fund us, we'll answer the call. 
a measly million dollars is all. You are looking at the people who created making stuff. Our record should be music to your ears. You're looking at the people who got ratings, sure enough, the best that Nova's tallied up in years. And what about our viewers? Let's admit it, they impress. They're curious, they're wealthy, and what's more? We brought a record number of them right to PBS and brought down their average age to 64. Come on, CPB guys, don't make such talent grovel and crawl. Keep your eyes on the prize, a measly million dollars is all. Oh, I, I, you'll, you'll need, know, need to know to get one joke. The head of Nova is named Paula. Okay, you'll need that. Okay, did you read our great proposal? The ideas at your disposal. There is no question that our shows will succeed. Colder, safer, faster, cheaper. Can't you see that we're a keeper? And there's nobody much deeper in need. The Science Channel doesn't program science anymore. Discoveries all fishing boats and crabs. Nat Geo's ratings hover somewhere just above the floor. I'm telling you, the field is up for grabs. The concept's unassailable. And Alan Alda's unavailable. Come on, PBS guys, don't make such talent grovel and crawl. Keep your eyes on the prize, the writing's up on the wall. This shouldn't even be a close call. Come on, you guys, just do it for Paula. A measly million dollars is all. A measly million dollars is all. It's a drop in the bucket. <laughs> so when people ask whether or not the arts help in business, you can just talk to them about that. <laughs> That's right. Uh, <laughs> I really don't think so. I, I got to say, if I had the talent to be able to put those things together, a lot of my PowerPoint presentations to people would disappear in favor of that kind of thing. <laughs> We're almost out of time. We have one more question here. I'd like. I don't know if I can follow that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. But what I wanted to say, David, is that I've seen you on Nova, and I, it's an incredible show. Not to demasculate you, but were you frightened doing something? <laughs> The, 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 quest, the question was, because you didn't have a microphone, but in terms of the Nova, uh, things that you were doing, like shooting AK-47 and I think swimming with sharks and other things, paragliding, were, paragliding yep. weren't, weren't you afraid of that? Um, you know, weirdly not, because it's like, it's, it, to me, it's kind of like when you get on a roller coaster, you know, you must be this tall. Um, I just sort of figure they know what they're doing. They, they, it, would be in their own, it would be in their own disinterest to kill the host halfway through filming. <laughs> So I just, I just sort of trusted them. And, and apparently, um, that was sort of naive, because like. <laughs> you know what happened with Darren on Bewitched? They switched to Darren out one season to another. <laughs> like, like at the end of the, of the shooting of the first series, there, everyone was sitting around having drinks, the crew and the cameraman, and they were all laughing. Like, um, apparently, each time they present one of these things, I'm supposed to have veto power. I'm supposed to say, I don't think that one, but that I would do. But that never occurred to me. <laughs> Oh, really? Okay. You know, like, and, and they said they had worked with previous hosts who were like afraid of everything. Like they wouldn't even like go up a tall building or whatever. And they're like, you know, this is just so funny. We go from a host who's terrified of everything to a host who has no clue what he's getting into. Um, the, the, the most, the really, the, the truly the only time I was ever really afraid. Well, first of all, the, the shark thing is really, really scary because the way they get the sharks over to you, it, they chump, right. They, they, have, they have bloody fish guts called chum. And there's a train, there's a, not a train, there's a professional shark expert lady. And, and she and the cameraman and her assistant were all wearing chainmail bodysuits. <laughs> not me! So, um, and, and she would attract the, the sharks by waving this chum. And she said, now, the, the sharks, uh, they're not going to hurt you, but don't wave your hands too. 
<laughs> because they'll think you have food too. So that's why if you see the footage, I'm like this. <laughs> um, and the shark would, like, if the, the, the shark, I mean, if you can imagine, I mean, you've seen sharks, they have these dead eyes, and they have like 11 rows of teeth, you know? So, like, if you're me, and this is the, the lady, she's like, come and get your chum, and the shark would go like, and then, and then like, what about you? Do you have any? And it would like, come right at me, and I'm like, oh, blah, 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 you know, like, and then at the last minute, turn away, like at the last second, like, oh, oh, oh. So yeah, the water in that Bahama area is a little warmer than you know. <laughs> um, Well, uh, w with that, I want to thank David for coming out tonight to help with this Westport Stories Live. Thank you. I want to thank all of you for coming out. I want to thank our home audience for playing along with us at home. And thank you all. Again, if you're interested in doing uh, some of these yourselves, give us a call, talk to us, talk to the people here at the library, and we hope to do more of these uh, for the community as well. So thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well done. That was great. Thank you.